Um, welcome, guys, to another episode of Consciously Curious, where we dissect those that are thriving in their passion. On today's episode, we're going to be talking into talking about artisanal knife making with yes, Jean Gabriel. Um, welcome, welcome, friend. Yeah, good to see you, man. Uh, well, obviously, it's it's been some time we've met before outside of the strict confine of the podcast, and I'm glad to see you're doing well. Yes, likewise. Uh, you know, and just uh, you can call me Gabby. Feel free. Sure. All my closest friends do. Okay. Um, so you don't get tongue tied. <laughs> uh, so yeah, man, uh, I'm an open book. Let's chat. What can do you want to know okay. about knife making? Yeah, and you know, um, can we take take me back to the moment where this sparked it off for you you know mm. let's go back in time all right well there's a story of me as a knife maker but there's the story of me as someone you know interested in knives mm -hmm. go, uh, goes back to my childhood uh probably you know i we've uh i mentioned this before but i have two eccentric parents and uh both of them interestingly enough is archetypes almost speak to a polarity of what's intriguing about knives on the one hand my mother is a lifelong martial artist mm. coming from uh, the chinese uh, shaolin school of uh, fighting and she specialized in blade combatives uh, and so you know there's a martial aspect for destruction mm. and then we have kind of the other pillar of creation kind of stewarded by my dad who's a ridiculously talented cook although mm. he doesn't do that for a living he uh you know he was always uh that kind of was uh a view of knives as some a tool for creation or sustenance right. uh giving life so uh but really the galvanizing moment was my mother, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Italy in our childhood village or town. Uh, and that's, I draw a lot of inspiration from there. I still try to go back every year. And uh, there is a town just right next to ours called Cesenatico in our region of Romagna, which is a great, you know, it's known for among other things. We have some of the best food in Italy. Uh, even people from other regions will concede that <laughs> we have uh, we have some of the best beaches. Uh, we're on we're in the northeast, so if you triangulate Florence and uh, Venice, uh, we're kind of a bunch of hillbillies from flatlands, okay. but with a sprinkling of beach bum. Mm. And uh, anyways, I digress. Yeah. Uh, there's this one town called Cisenatico, which is very, uh, if anyone's been there, it's very picturesque. Mm. Uh, a lot of family-owned sailboats for generations. You mm. can find some of the old uh, fishing ships from back in the day. And there was a small knife shop there that I went into a few times with my mother. And her whole thing was like, if we weren't POSs over the course of the year and behaved ourselves, we'd be... <laughs> potentially walk out with a pocket knife and I slowly amassed a small collection. Okay. But the whole thing was pretty sensory and I, I just recall walking into this cavernous place and and uh, it was run by a husband and wife team and from what I know unfortunately the husband passed away and uh, she just lost steam and, and keeping the shop open and it doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. But uh, I mean, you had knives from all over the world, and he was, if I'm not mistaken, sharpening, if not making his own knives. Uh, so fast forward, you know, this all kind of lingered. I, uh, the interest in knives, interestingly, my first attempt was making the equivalent of like a, a prison shank, essentially. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, my, so our ancestral house uh, was kind of derelict after the war. My grandfather spent time, you know, as a child during the war, left, came back years later, squatted the house, got the land rights and rebuilt it. Mm. And uh, kind of one of the outcomes of that was we had just buckets of bomb shrapnel. Mm. And it was like, uh, you know, I, I kind of got free reign. I used to actually build bicycles and work on bikes in our Capanone or you know, what most people would call their garage meets mm. barn workshop type deal. And I was left to my own devices a lot. And I just, I was like, oh man, I wonder if I can make one of those. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know I was, I was de you know, I'm a kid. I didn't even, I couldn't process the idea of bringing steel to an ostentatious state and heat. I just started pounding this cold steel on an anvil. And okay. 
and uh, you know that was my idea of, of making my glorious knife slash prison shank slash you know <laughs> it's really a pretty ghetto attempt so did you so <laughs> did you have a mentor at all no I'm uh, interesting you should ask I'm mostly self-taught wow. uh, so fast forward 2011 like I was not finding much inspiration in the world of advertising which I was in and you know life had kind of this other stuff going on you know <laughs> one graduates in 2008 in a crowded field to begin with yeah. and the economy is terrible and you know it's like you get, this is the story of many people right this is why uh, you know it's such a hot topic of discussion but you leave school Maybe you have some student debt, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's New York and City. You've been told story You're hustling. That you can yeah, there's this all, all this mythology about the, the middle class, and and here you are doing the same job you had prior, mm -hmm. except prior you didn't have the debt burden. So, point is, hustling in New York, okay. doing what you can. Uh, I was I was working. I was freelancing, doing long term freelance, and you know other odd jobs here and there. And I've I've kind of two parallel resumes. I've done some really mundane uh, jobs that didn't pay anything, and I've I've also been with the top you know some top ad executives in the pitch room. It's yeah. very strange, like yin and yang. And uh, but the story really goes that I just you know I was like you know what I'm gonna give this a go. Uh, some friends helped me out via Kickstarter. I got a, some essential pieces of gear, except, you know, you have a hard enough time paying rent in New York City. Imagine getting an industrial space and, mm. you know, hipsterdom. <laughs> and uh, and uh, at that time, there weren't any cats really making knives. Mm. Uh, and that takes on its own life, uh, the evolution of the knife scene. But I was in the dead of winter on my roof on my apartment building in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like, you know, below freezing and I was just grinding knives. I didn't even know I was going to heat treat them. And I actually got locked out of my roof by my <laughs> landlord as a result. <laughs> and uh, yeah, other folks in the building weren't thrilled. Uh, Making but, a ruckus. But yeah, man, I used to go like covered in covered in steel downstairs to the donut shop and they'd be laughing their asses off because you know here i am it looked like it came out of a freaking steel plant okay uh so that was huh. that was the inception that was and 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 my vision what i do has gone through several generations or it, iterations yeah uh and part of that has to do with all the different places i ended up because i actually moved to la on a whim wow uh, shortly after that for, and, and uh, what was that motivation for? Well, uh, eventually I just made peace with the fact I had a buddy who worked for an automation firm. He had been friend, a friend for years, and he was just uh, stretched way too thin as, a, as the one-man marketing team at his mm. robotics uh, firm. And he just invited me along to help him kind of augment what he's trying to do and Sure enough, he had been kind of like floating around this idea of going and starting a West Coast division. And uh, and I, I was like... He was, was in New York with you at the time? Yeah. I was, okay. like, I was like, yo, dude, you know, I know Wow, it's time to put... It's time to let the rubber meet the road. You know, go submit a business plan or whatever. Let's get it together. And we pitched it and freaking they were like, how soon could you get out there? And, you know, within, I think, a month like packed up my wow. life and moved out to LA. Did you have a, did you, were you married at that time? No, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, living the life of a, oh, of a I got you. bachelor. And um, so, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, ha, 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 you know, we're moving to LA. Mm -hmm. There's a house with a massive garage, partially subsidized by the company because we're working out of the house. And uh, the weather's good all year round. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't, you know, I didn't, direct the attention I should have to the knives immediately landing. It kind of I had to get my legs under me, yeah. navigate some other stuff, you know, of course, full time job, all this. And yeah. um, and later on, I actually made up for lost time and moved into a pretty sick shop with uh, a number of people doing pretty cool stuff under a roof. OK. Uh, and that's when things really I, I worked up a waiting list and kind of chased that dream of like living and dying by the deposits you get chasing the end of a list uh and um my 
skill levels increased exponentially. I also happened to be in the room with a bunch of cats that taught me about all kinds of stuff. There were dudes building choppers and stuff in the building and they would teach me at a weld and, and another guy would teach me like, uh, ran like framing. Uh, and the, and then at the same time, actually I was moonlighting. I was helping a, a guy in the building out. Shout out to, uh, uh, JR. Uh, he had a furniture company that was kind of blowing up and I was doing a lot of his marketing stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, forge knives, then walk across the hall and basically play marketing. Mm -hmm. Want to be marketing executive. Yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, it's a bit of a tangent, but, uh, LA ended up being pretty productive in that sense. And, uh, the building is pretty funny because the way cir cir uh, the way that came about was pretty interesting because there's like an underground <laughs> there's a whole world and I'm sure many know uh, of pe uh, a network of people that through Burning Man connections like mm. pays dividends in real life right because I was actually uh, a friend of a friend recommended that I get involved with this building which had been an industrial level illegal marijuana grow site and okay. then they got raided by the feds and then the landlord's like oh man we should really go legit <laughs> and uh, they ended up breaking it up into uh, kind of like workspaces sure sure and uh, hence, you would have like a house music podcast, recording studio, furniture builders, oh, guys wow. making choppers. Every time you came in, you were like greeted by a little mob of pit bulls. It was, and then there was my little corner. I was like, you know, raising hell on an anvil, much to people's chagrin. And uh, that lived its course and, and then finally landed in Chicago. And yet again, uh, the scope of the project changed because by the end of L.A., I had all the hallmarks of something I could scale, mm. but knife making became really, a, I kind of fell out of love with it. I was like, this kind of, I don't have fun doing it right now mm. because you're, you're hustling so hard and uh, making nothing really in reality you want to make. So you weren't, what do you mean? You were making knives though, right? I mean, I was what, making knives, but, but you know, so-and-so wants a wedding gift. So-and-so wants a birthday gift and they have all these parameters and it's like, at that point, you reach a fork in the road where you need to decide what kind of business you're going to have. And I, uh, I eventually came to the conclusion where um, I'd rather make what I like and whoever ends know, up. Uh, I have a waiting list. And if, just, if it just so happens someone likes what I make and they want to grab it, cool. But I'm not going to handle What an interesting model. Uh, yeah, not very lucrative, <laughs> but I have a day job. And, and it, that in itself is part of the journey because it's like you, pray, you pay the price. You know, you, you're a freaking nine to fiver. But at the end of the day, it's like you don't have a base level of anxiety. And it was back to making what I loved. Mm. And, uh, and who knows what form it'll take in the future. This is just a temp all is temporal. Uh, so I had to make peace with that because it's kind of like you trick yourself, especially entrepreneurs. You're like, it's, it's make or break it's it, it got to do this or bust and i was really hard on myself i was like i got to do everything to make this knife thing possible to the point of like putting myself through a lot of discomfort uh giving up a lot of creature comfort it's like w why so much suffering for this thing that you love so it, it's not a problem it's just a prioritization that needs to happen i wonder if you stuck with it for a little longer your name would have gotten more out there to the point where you could be more selective on your projects well eventually yeah that's right. uh that's kind of what i did i would say um now uh you know the departure from trying to make a living from knives explicitly full time that was it was also a concerted effort in like you know what it's time to get much better at this too. Mm. And I look, you didn't feel like it, you were learning or no, no, no. I just, experimenting? um, yeah, I feel, felt like I wasn't experimenting anymore. And that I, of course that's a function of like, you have to answer, you know, industries of scale. It's like, you gotta, if you got 10 knives and they kind of, have the, you gotta heat treat them all the same way you gotta, which means you're using the same steels, which means, you know, then you buy, you go buy exotic woods and it's like, well, you know, stock, <laughs> you want to stock uniformly for, the, mm. uh, 
you weren't I wasn't going one by one anymore mm. and I like going one by one and losing myself in a knife okay Be- because like we've said before I'm very superstitious about certain things and I think when you buy a handmade item there's a sorcery that's going on in a way it's alchemical all the energy invested is in that object and there's so much history yeah you're buying a story because there are a lot of awesome you can go buy a sick very functional $25 camping knife, right? You know, well, some will last, some won't, but they all kind of do the same thing. And people, people kind of like the mythology of the knife. And a a lot of this has to do with kind of like lifestyle marketing to the way things are today. But, um, it's a wedge piece of steel Mm -hmm. that's heat treated sandwiched between a couple of planks. Right. And, uh, fundamentally like, don't kid yourself. People, People come at this and they want to turn it into like they and, and rightly so from a marketer's perspective. Right. You want to build a mythology around your company, your operation, but you can't. It's always function over everything mm. is my thought. And um, utility, utility. Yeah. It's a utilitarian object. It's not a piece of art. And when I hear about people that have knives that they spend a lot of money on mine, whoever's else and it stays in a mantle or never comes out of the drawer it drives me insane because i'd rather you beat the shit out of it and then you hit me up in a year and you're like yo can you set some time aside uh to refurbish this thing Mm. i'm like hell yeah because i want you to give it to your kid and your kid to give it to their kid Mm. and that's and they'll forever be in possession of my lifespan spent on that knife yeah i'm making you're making an investment in me i'm making an investment in you you have you've captured that energy i'll never get back in my life i only make so many knives in my lifetime okay. it's a two-way street so sounds kind of harsh and it sounds very but rethinking what you're doing instead of just purely paying bills affords you the ability way, to say the no. ability to think that way yeah, yeah. sounds like you're an elitist dick kind of but this is just my philosophy i don't speak for everyone right uh i have very uh you know i'm a person of several unpopular opinions maybe this is one of them (laughs) but i blabbed on long enough is there uh what else would you like to know about knives um i want to know how you so i love how it's like you you invest so much love and time um and money into each piece you know individually Mm -hmm. um can you take me through the process of um, acquiring the inspiration like is there a setting or a thought or people that like you source that inspiration from mm. great question right. how, how is the, uh, how different is each knife from each other right how unique they're all, they're all right I so for one each one is that, it, yeah. exactly it has its own story so yeah. tell me like where you get the inspo from uh it's a good question one not unfortunately most people don't kind of pump the brakes and ever ask me you know it's like sometimes things are transactional uh, with customers and sometimes I have deep conversations but the reality is you know I'm in business school uh, were it not for that I mean I reached in uh, I reached a fork in the road my one of my passions my lifelong passions is history and anthropology and mm-hmm. I was like well are we going to go down the road of being a curmudgeonly academic with a PhD in anthropology mm-hmm. at a time where you know maybe tenure is not a reality and everything's political and you're submitting papers to get paid or you're gonna go to business school and uh at the end of the day even though i didn't go down that road uh i draw a tr- i i'm always reading mm-hmm. i have uh an insatiable appetite for learning about uh past civilizations kind of the mysteries uh and my mother and pre- well both my parents instilled that at a very young age just a rabid appetite for reading Mm -hmm. so um it's not that one knife will have one inspiration some people work thematically like that in the knife scene uh some people actually explicitly do historical reproduction it's kind of like there are a bunch of for me there are a bunch of themes converging in one blade that makes it kind of a frankenstein weird yeah uh knife and uh a lot of my knives actually kind of jaunt and uh category bend Okay. Uh, some people like that. Some people don't. Uh, but I do kind like... Kind of a crossover. Yeah, I like the view of like a camping knife that maybe you can go use as a petty knife if you're in a kitchen <laughs> on a trip or uh, just style bending like that. So 
that's a long-winded answer, but I draw inspiration mostly from uh, kind of distant lands, uh, ages past. I try to think almost sometimes as a caveman who's like, you distill what a knife is on a primal functional level and work from there, and you find that it's more about ergonomics and certain stuff like that than kind of bells. And Some people get lost in the weeds with materials. Everyone in knife making comes from a different perspective. You have the aerospace machinists who are like love using mills and CNCs. You have uh, the blacksmith maybe who uh, is doing more kind of ornamental iron work. Uh, sometimes you have the stock reduction people, which is a method of knife making that's more modern, and that's totally fine. It's uh, uh, I generally stylistically to. It, answer your question very concretely my style my inspiration is i leave traces of the process on the knife mm. which makes them less finished because in my view you can get plenty of finished knives like i already said from uh that are mass produced that are right. great right. they serve their purpose but again you're buying a story too i think many times people will pick the knife that really has a specific weird story associated with it. That's the one they'll show people and talk about. They'll it's interesting. Um, so I wonder, do you do you sometimes then? Because it's okay to have not like a lack of inspiration. So I wonder if you kind of just like you're maybe looking for wood for the handle, or you're looking for metal, and like that object spoke to you, and uh -huh. and then you just kind of start from there. Because a lot of people, I think, is the hardest part is starting. And it's mm. like they get hung up on maybe not having a destination in view or maybe a lack of inspiration. Mm. But when you kind of start from any part of the end product and you go from there, that I think that'll get the ball rolling. For sure. Yeah. Um, people think things to death. And as someone who lives in his head, I had to spend a lot of my life kind of coming to terms with the fact that sometimes you just got to get moving. Mm. That sometimes that means pulling out a piece of paper and doodling like you're a kid mm. again, right? Some of my best, best knife designs have been the product of that. Uh, don't stew too much. And then if you don't have inspiration and you are stewing and you, you kind of feel helpless, understand, another thing I've suffered a great amount uh, of setbacks from is like, you know, you want to be original. You want to do something different, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like, my background is in the visual arts, so like some of the other cats I run space with here. Shout out to Julius. Like he's a, he's a painter predominantly. Yeah. And Fire then he furniture. arrived at woodworking. Love his but, stuff. Yeah. Um, we all arrived at our crafts through art, fine art. Uh, so sometimes like you're hell bent on doing something different, but it's like uh, my wife, for instance, she's like a business person through and through. She's like, a hustler and she's, she's like you're you're thinking you're spreading yourself thin thinking tripping yourself out and at the end of the day for all the wanting to do something revolutionary convention exists for a reason mm. fall back on convention convention is a tool it's not something to fear it's like none of us will want to do what mom and dad told us right so how many dis how many knives that don't make uh, design sense do you have to produce to understand that Mm. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that answers your question I say just get going yeah start exactly. doodle like um, I think it's the best thing you can do and, and at the end of the day the most useful way to do that is have a big surface that's clear not crowded with crap that's always available to throw some ideas down on yeah just roll out a giant thing of paper yeah. I believe in big notebooks Mm. Um, and uh, don't worry about what it is functionally. Yeah, just have some fun. Yeah, you might not make it. I dig it. Yeah. Um, is there a favorite part? The last three posts, I love. I love the the kind of explanation of the the process. Is there a favorite uh. part of the process of of knife making? And mm. um, I I didn't do too much research into the process, but you know, in yeah. in high school, I shine shoes and that was a very like hands-on cathartic experience and it kind of it kind of got me to a point of um a very present 
moment. Um, I, I just like didn't think about the present or the, the past or the future, and I was just in the zone, laser focus kind of thing. So it is I'm, I'm guessing because it's all this is very hands on. So, but is mm. there a favorite part of of the process for you? Yeah, uh, to your point, one cannot. Pay, um, one cannot speak highly enough about this idea of the flow state, right? It's yeah. kind of a cliche at this point, I but know. anyone, I think there's a, it doesn't matter what you do. There's a brotherhood, sisterhood amongst people who work with their hands, no matter the, the discipline you'll be, a, you'll be on vacation across the world, poke your head in some cubby where some guy's hand making shoes. Great example. Like I once had the great privilege of meeting Danny day Lewis of all people and I talked about cobbling for an hour with them and we were comparing notes on similar, you know, making knives versus making shoes. Cause I don't know if you know, oh. but he disappeared. No, I didn't know that. He lived in Florence under the radar I for a couple no of idea. years. So you might want to check that out. Oh. But the point is two radically different disciplines. And yet there's right. so many, uh, so I get what you're saying. Like it can be shiny. It can be anything mundane, um, losing yourself in detail. I'm a person who has a hard time staying focused, right? And yet there's a space where like, I don't check my phone. It's late at night. I'm in perhaps one of the creepier buildings from a superficial point of view in Chicago. I'm like, it's charming. It's like, I wouldn't be anywhere else. It's the best place on earth. And it's up to each person to create that best place on earth for themselves. It's a state of mind. It's not a, it's not a, it's not GPS coordinates. So but to the actual knife making process, um, each one speaks to a facet of my personality. Oh, wow. And I think a lot of people, you know, you'll be in moods where you want to like, just, you, it's like, fuck, you know, I'm a quarter way on this knife in a stage I don't like, but I have to get through this to do what I want to do. And I was like, maybe you stick that thing in a drawer and you don't look at it for a while. But if I had to pick one, I think what's, truly because knife making is very in fashion right now right uh we can talk about that if you like but uh i think an aspect that's not paid enough attention to that's kind of like oh i guess this is this is like a minor part of the freaking operation and then i'll get back to making the actual sharp object and adding the cool woods and metals and it's Mm. like dude a knife is only as good as its heat treatment, mm. right? And that's more a question of metallurgy and material sciences. If a knife maker will generally get accustomed to working with certain steels and operate with those if they're smart because they know that steel. Steel is very durable, so people write it off, uh, you know, is like, well, um, kind of like... like even more so than wood sometimes, for instance, but even wood has very temperamental as a lot of us know. So, but steel is too, it's a living organism. So when you're heat treating a knife, it's like witchcraft. It's like sorcery. It's speaking to you. You can, a lot of people like, Oh, you got to test it with a magnet make sure you can pull it and you should be in a dark room and all this. I'm like, those are all good tent, good principles. Uh, but watch, slow down, Look at it. It's speaking to you. You can see how it's changing. And the more you work with the steel, you almost like, it's like, um, it's a back and forth relationship. It's mm-hmm. something to respect. And I think people brush over that because for whatever reason, it's just the less sexy, more time consuming aspect of making a knife. But if I were to focus in any area, it would be layered steels and how that, uh, translates to metallurgy and uh really assembling the knife and i like sculpting a knife so to speak when it's kind of more in its final stages kind of like Mm. this uh this is a giant hunting knife right okay um that's in the fun zone that's like now we're playing sculptor each each part of the knife making process kind of embodies tenets of a certain artisan Mm. um it's uh, there's no I don't know if that answers your, it, your question, but it heat does. treatment it, it, is... They a, each fill your cup in a different way. Yeah, but I yeah. think heat treatment, uh, you know, if you, make a, if you make a bushcraft knife and you can baton it through a small tree trunk over and over and over and there's no f- uh, flaking of the blade or bending of the blade and stuff like that, 
honestly, I don't care what the handle is. You can mm-hmm. always put more wood on the knife. You can always, uh, you can always, if it rusts, you can always take the rust off. But if the, if the, it's a combination of like the blade geometry has to be there mixed with the heat treatment. Mm. The knife doesn't matter if it doesn't nail those things down. And there are a lot of kind of like fair weather knife makers or a lot of people that it's like it's hours and hours of failure and you need to kind of dance with the devil on these details. Mm. Uh, there's can't skip pen, a step. There's penance to pay. Yeah. It's the only way you'll become good at it. Otherwise, you're making garbage. Back to basics. So, huh. Um, as far as... Uh, are, do you have you you can make mistakes when you're mm-hmm. when you're tr- treating it with heat yes. but the nice thing is you can go back you can like change it there, it's mm. can you you can't not always oh that's it that's funny that you should ask that that's kind of there's no easy way to answer that a good knife maker will say eh <laughs> oh like you can burn steels for instance if you're going over 2000 degrees and 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 a lot of people like me um, you know, if you're kind of bootstrapping it and you don't have a fancy pants like electric uh, forge or what have you, um, the onus is on you to be that much more attentive. But you can overheat steel, which will make it brittle after cooling. Oh. Like there are a number of things that can go wrong and blades will break in half. And if you're making a knife, you should test the crap out of it um, before you sell it to someone, especially if they're paying money for it. So... Um, Wow, so you can. I didn't know that. You can. There's not you can't always walk away from it. Wow. There are times though where like if you haven't burnt the steel but the, you feel the heat treat, treat wasn't strong or it didn't actually harden the way you wanted to or et cetera, you can kind of uh I would normalize it without getting lost in the weeds. Mm. But uh I would normalize that steel and work from there. Don't cut corners. That's all. Okay. Um, and now how are you, is it just a, a practice or how did you come to, to understand at what point it's ready? Uh, as a finished product? No, before when you're heat treating, I guess. Oh, uh, is it well, time timing? Yeah. So usually or the, the color, is it color? Does it like burn? Well, yeah, I superficially, uh, when it steel is ostentatious, you want it to be like a nice, uh, orange or red, which, you know, if you've watched movies, you'll always really... That Iron Man <laughs> scene. Or, yeah, or, like, even in Game of Thrones, it's yeah. like, the poor blacksmith, he's always back there, right? <laughs> and some people have done their due diligence. There would be, like, some grip on set who's like, yo, if you have a, a blacksmith, like, the steel should be red. He should be working steel. <laughs> but then you have, like, the folks from Hollywood that don't know their ass from their elbow. And it's like, why is this guy pounding on a cold block of steel that there's no way you could draw out you know a half inch block of steel especially if it's cold so uh uh that's funny yeah i've never talked to someone who had issues with that stuff because we've always seen it in the medical community with like the you know medical shows and things like that but that oh yeah they 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 fuck up in other areas of life too yeah yeah (laughs) and and i will say only because everyone and their mom brings this up right like forged in fire that tv show oh yeah history channel it's like a cringe fest. Like I have fun watching it, but <laughs> it's like the the spectrum of talent on that show. You get some OGs that are like lifelong lifers, dudes that like, and you can tell they're cool under pressure, mm. cool as cucumbers. A lot of them have questionable design sense, but they're like they they understand the process on a See, very deep yeah. level. Then you get like dudes, you know, you get like these young kind of naive cats who haven't been working very long and they're just like more concerned with aesthetics and making it your sword look like an elvish object from Lord uh, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, but there's like between those polarity is so much I don't know if it's the way it's edited sometimes or if it's genuine negligence but it's mm. no it's it's no coincidence that so much of the stuff made in that show looks like a turd Man, it's uh, like if you were producing I've, a show, you would think, and, and other artisans are watching, mm-hmm. you would think you wanna you wanna live up to the you know live up to it. Yeah, it's a shame. Um, some people won't talk about it. Some people are lib, you know keyboard warring it right, on right. on forums about it. A lot of knife makers are just like, Ugh. Uh, they they before the first season, I actually got hit up by one of their casting agents and uh, the I don't know or 
maybe even an intern but the email was so ghetto it was like oh i i chalked it up to being like you know a phishing scam or something like that and i uh i turned it down and uh in a way i'm glad because there's a stigma the the quality's increased but uh there was a long time i think where knife makers were like i don't know if i want my brand lumped in with kind of that it's interesting like if you could uh, s- still separate yourself when you're on the show kind of thing you know yeah i mean a lot of people are just the victim of like poor time management they'll be really good knife makers but they fall apart working under pressure um a lot of times there's some people that like cut corners about some vital aspects of knife making and to to the credit of people who aren't particularly talented or who have kind of uh fallen apart on the show or not performed how they wanted uh a lot of it can be chalked up to history channel just the premise of the show is just so ridiculous and that cool it's good to know how to work with recycled steels i use a lot of reclaimed steel but you can't do it willy-nilly like Mm -hmm. and a lot of those people are a victim of like something no fault of their own which is like the blade will crack and it's like on a test and it's like yo like of course it did (laughs) you know (laughs) this you shouldn't be have been using these garbage steels so i don't know if you watch that show but i just thought i would uh touch on that because you know of course everyone brings it up uh it's a point of reference for sure knife making yeah um let's talk about sourcing okay and i because you mentioned it with julius on your podcast mm-hmm. um you're very thoughtful yes i try to be right uh, like you try to find the backstory of where that came from and what it's been through and and you try to try to take care of it as best you can through your process yeah i i i guess it's kind of like uh i put a great deal of thought in the hunting material uh, I maybe did more so in LA in some ways because there I had a really robust economy, like underground kind of mafia of guys that did other things that would circulate their ends. So like, uh, you know, a great example is a friend who makes electric guitar bodies and he uses like the highest end woods. Something that, frankly, I don't, uh, I have different views on, but whatever, like it's all these weird little dimensions and maybe it's not enough to make a handle skill out of, but you can sandwich it and, and, uh, make it into a stack of, for a full, a hidden tank kitchen. eye, whatever. I got really creative in finding ways to use this wood. Uh, and some, a lot of it really beautiful, like, uh, shout out to smiley out in LA is another guy, smiley barnacle, barnacle brothers. He's like one of the biggest fiberglass, uh, artisans probably on earth who does stuff for the uh, Venice Biennale and you know his his work is insane Hmm. Um, he also happens to be a member of Douche LaRouche and was on that show Sacred Steel Hmm. briefly Uh, I think it's Discovery motorcycle guy we met each other Burning Man this is a guy who very loyally for uh, some time would like give me the most baller like woods so I have no problem working with exotic woods but I get very creative about how to find them I don't I try not to buy them on the open market uh, because there's the deforestation is, is very tragic and to me not worth it um, that's just my bias yeah uh, I I do work with a lot of reclaimed steel but that's touch and go you gotta you gotta test first because um, it, it's a toss up like farriers wraps files pretty reliable saw blades is like big giant rotary saw blades like you never know what you're getting it depends on the time period yeah that's another safe bet that everyone loves especially for larger format uh i've used mach- i'm using machetes and longer blades uh is you know truck leaf spring mm. you can find mm. a ton of oh, that at junkyards okay. and if you're starting out in bladesmithing i highly recommend that's the route you go um does that answer? Yeah. Of, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, so when when someone approaches you um, for a knife, or when someone is knife sh- shopping for a knife, what questions should they be asking? What mm-hmm. should it feel like in their hand? Great question. Well, you should like what you're buying. You know, don't try to keep up with the Joneses and like mm. just accumulate crap like it's collector cigars. Just make sure it feels good in your hands. Ergonomics is important. Um, 
ask a lot of questions not only for quality assurance reasons and to but also like you should know about what you're buying if it's handmade because hey you look cool at a dinner party if mm. everyone knows the story behind a knife but like oh so and so introduced me to this artisan knife maker and you know they gave me this i bought i spent four thousand dollars i don't sell knives i'm just joking i'm <laughs> making a point but you know some people equate sticker price with quality and it's like i have news for you that's very much not the case so be vigilant ask questions but don't be obnoxious either there are mm. those people who think they know how to make knives just because they saw some youtube videos um, it's very easy to make knives unpopular opinion Ooh. Uh, very easy to make knives it's very hard to make good knives mm. a lot of people make quality knives that are ass ugly oh. so <laughs> so make sure you like what you're buying yeah and um and just get you know get involved like go to their website people are very generous like just even if you can shadow them for a day and just hang out bring them oh. a six pack of beer yeah what, be like hey what day are you at the shop would you mind some company and can i just hang out or some people are more accessible than you would think yeah i like to stay accessible that's why i've kind of thinned the herd and use my methodology some people are so busy running a business though that like <laughs> good luck getting a hold of them like some some dudes uh i can name a million small knife smaller knife shops non-industrial scale knife shops that like trying to get a hold of them because they have a three year wait list. Holy shit. Uh, you know, I could name a million of them. Some of them uh, I know, a couple of them I'm friends with. Um, yeah. And you, and that's what you, you don't want to become. You, you, you don't want to uh, get lost. Not yet. It's, that. it's my choice. It's not, yeah. it's not because there's anything wrong with that. It's just how I want to live my life right now. Yeah. I have a number of other obligations that I right, think are important. Right like a puppy <laughs> like a puppy uh, but um yeah man i mean the knife the knife world right now is an exciting place yeah there are a lot of people there uh shows like forge and fire stuff like that it's a boon for a discipline that unfortunately was dying uh and it's great to have a bunch of new folks getting there but with that there's the issue of like it's kind of like cycling or any other pastime like you get the weekend warriors that have other giant they just dump a, a ton of money into brand new gear to make like that's, uh, it's like uh congratulations that's cool sometimes i'm envious of people like that if i'm honest it's like man you know it's like they have like stuff to make knives on an industrial scale but they haven't put in the hours and the failure success they don't go out they don't go network for they don't learn from other people. They don't ask questions. Yeah. Other knife makers, many of them, especially ones I met, and you know we've talked about this prior to this, but uh, it's it's very unfortunate that a lot of the world's best knife makers actually don't have proteges, and that's mm. something I'm very it's passionate sad, yeah. about. So it's like, if if there's some cat, if there's some OG knife maker, and I met a couple in Italy, for example. I've spent the day with them. I want. I learn everything I can conceivably learn from them. I shut up. I take the back seat, and that's my best advice for anything you want to learn about in life. Mm -hmm. You are a guest. You are in the domain of someone else. People are very generous with their knowledge, but that requires, you know, the the, the handshake you make is you are a guest. You're not to interrupt their day, and this is something that's handed down in martial arts. Something I'm very passionate about especially in the chinese schools uh my mother to reach a very high level in kung fu and and then also the more esoteric disciplines like feng soi you have to do a lot of groveling you're on your knees begging people to teach you mm. and you come and and maybe uh the sun goes down and you come back the next day and you do the same thing until they teach you this is a very old school way mm -hmm. uh and it's so people can vet you and uh you know, those mechanisms exist, exist in all kinds of worlds, whether you're learning uh, martial arts, motorcycle clubs, one percenter clubs, uh, like, uh, you know, <laughs> all kinds of things. Even like I, I worked for some time, a lot of people don't know, as a butcher. Uh, you know, that's a great example of a world where you shut up, you take the back seat mm. and they'll teach you everything you need to know. But you need to be patient. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas 
you know, for in other things, um, especially with like social media, the cost of entry, maybe to like starting a business is so low, mm. but then the failure rate is so high because they just don't understand what it takes to, to run a successful business. They haven't gone through the failures. Yes, exactly. It's the order of the day. And it's good because people like that have no staying power. They don't stick around, mm. but they make the money circulate. They keep knife supply companies open. They keep uh, a lot of, I'll give you an example. A lot of the, uh, st- the steels that come from that lend themselves to cutlery are actually very expensive to make. Less people make them because, uh, you know, it's just economics. Um, they, it becomes harder and harder to find these steels. Less people make them. But all these people arriving, the demand is good for us who stick mm. around. Right, it keeps people making things, keeps people producing our favorite products. So that's why I don't poo-poo all these kind of like, uh, kind of like more fair weather knife makers. Yeah, there are a number of people who have made names for themselves selling handmade knives they make. They don't make these knives, and if you spend five minutes on their Instagram, you understand this very quickly. And I won't name names. Sure, sure. To be fair, they're not explicitly knife makers. Some of them are like it becomes. People just want to jump into a category to kind of check that box mm. on their lifestyle brand. Oh I'll God. leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so besides um, seeking out a mentor, um, what are the basic necessities one needs to mm. start this process to get into the, the world, dive into the world of knife making? Uh, a qu- again, a question that has many different sure. a- kinds of answers, but like, I'll give you my philosophy and, and it tends to align with... Uh, probably some of the more the older cynical kind of OGs in the, in the knife scene are our forefathers uh, who we should always revere they uh, you can make a lot happen with very little you mm-hmm. should bootstrap and it's very easy to bootstrap I used to get very worked up about the fact that people who seem big big shop scene came so easily to them seemingly at the end of the day it's more important to learn the skills and the principles because they can translate across platforms and technologies. Probably one of the more valuable th- places I spent my time had nothing to do with knives. I was at that automation robotics firm because I learned about manufacturing. I learned about project management. I learned about uh, basic principles of milling and stuff like this. Not that I'm you know, an expert. It's just I can now delegate that kind of stuff. So... Um, I, y- there are a few essentials, you know, like... Invest in a belt grinder. That's obviously the biggest ticket item for a lot of people. Uh, Invest, you know, you can invest in an electric forge if you kind of don't want to deal with propane and Mm. or uh, even charcoal. Um, But really, like, yeah, bare essentials. Don't even worry about that. Like, you can make knife. You can have a nice set of files and make knives. You can have uh, you can have your an orbital sander you use for home improvement, and 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 form uh, basic knife handles. Just learn how the material interacts with you. That's what's important. Yeah. How do they get those? Uh, yeah. So it, without completely making a knife, how, what do they need to to hone these skills of making a blade and heat treating it and making the the mm. handle like. Well, nothing happens. All begins kind of like with the story of humanity with a single flame, fire. I am a blade. I call myself predominantly a bladesmith rather than a knife maker because I make the delineation. My preference is for forming something out of raw steel rather than stock reduction, which is like starting with a block of steel and then grinding the shape in. Uh, To me, it's important to shape a canvas. I like... Uh, the primal aspect of it because if I were honest like I love that and I kind of get bored with the rest of the process Mm. almost so my advice is spend some time on YouTube you can easily make a forge if that intimidates you nowadays I mean you can get a plug and play propane forge on even Amazon at this point (laughs) like just in a decade things have changed I, I wish I had started my journey I did a lot of I learned a lot of stuff the hard way but the best, the best tool and this is not a very interesting answer. Is YouTube? Yeah, yeah. They're awesome, awesome knife makers who okay. have made careers out of tutorial videos. Okay. Um, and 
people get tripped up like, oh no, it's YouTube's a big equalizer. You have guys that have been there for years who are like, no, all these people are going to arrive into my space and everyone's going to be making knives. And I'm like, that's definitely happened, but just there's, whatever. There's I mean, plenty to go around. <laughs> wait, get your slice. The genie, the genie's been let out of the box. Where are you going to turn back the clock on like, humanity? It's not a bad thing for people to be more aware of your industry. You know, it's, yeah. it's great. And like I said, let, these, the the trades are not handed down in closed circles anymore as much as i wish we still lived in times like that i'm just analog and old school like that i've you know a lot of unpopular opinions like i said but uh kind of what's going to save these disciplines is people's exposure to videos like that Mm. it's it's part of you know (laughs) people have all kinds of names like the library of alexandria like uh, there are many analogies made like uh but um that is essentially the library of alexandria that's the human record of of all endeavor that's if everything ends you could reconstruct civilization by people's empirical experimentation on video and and Mm -hmm. and there's no shame in that it's great we live in we live the best time to be alive for all the dark things going on honestly humans by large i do believe uh that uh living conditions are improving that uh that humans are on the brink of of tremendously beautiful things Mm -hmm. if it's wielded correctly okay okay Uh, so where the, where they should start kind of bring it back down to earth get just you don't even need a, like a 2 by 72 belt sander like I have because they can get very expensive just go get a belt sander put it put aside 500 bucks right some people that's a lot of money some people that's like chump change um, just put squirrel away some money and you could even go to estate sales or hit up Craigslist I've gotten some of my best gear off Craigslist mm three three components forge belt sander and a drill press the Mm. rest you can do with hand tools i work in a very low-tech old world way intentionally because it keeps me very engaged and taking my time in each part of the process Mm. everyone has an opinion in this world they buy all kinds of gear to do things quicker i i would be remiss if i said i had no interest in doing that at some point it's just like right now i just want to get really good yeah, and you, you can spend a lifetime getting. And that's really skipping good. steps. So yeah, um, I love that. Yeah, man. Back to basics. Um, how can a uh, knife maker put their name out there? How do you network with other knife makers? Are there conventions you go to? How do you how do you get your brand out there? Yeah. Um, well, the quintessential one you can do, even as a consumer, if anyone. Uh, as the impetus to go to blade show in Atlanta. That's kind of like the big one each year. It's kind of like Disneyland for knife, knife people. But, uh, there are many regional associations. Like I said, there's kind of a Renaissance going on. Mm. There are a number of forges here. So we're in Chicago right now Mm -hmm. for folks who weren't aware. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I arrived here, I, I didn't know there were any other knife makers from what I know. I think they're like four or five in the city. And then the, you get a lot of the guys that are kind of in the garages on flying under the radar as hobbyists. Um, social media is the engine that puts everyone in touch. I am terrible in that I have not made overtures to them and probably networked the way I should because life. Yeah. But uh, they, they're a lot of like, um, they call them like open anvils, uh, open forges. You can go and you can learn how to smith, uh, mm. which is a good life skill in general it doesn't have to be knives on the hierarchy of things to create on an anvil knife is very low it's a flat object right uh i i've made it my job uh not my actual job but i know how to create a number of different things on an anvil that have nothing to do with knives that are more 3d like even nails stuff mm. like this imagine forging a hundred nails like the old days oh wow. to build your little uh so <laughs> i digress um so social media and then the rest really comes down less a conversation about knives more when i channel my marketing executive uh notions of branding and uh yeah branding creating and the mythos, marketing the mythos creating a mythos the, yeah. which there's an alchemy to that Oof. uh and doing so in a way that's not disingenuous yeah uh but you should always be weaving webs 
So where I wonder where that comes from. Is it just uh, building up your your bank of vocabulary through reading in, incessantly? Like what? Where? You know, you do have a How way do with mean? words. I don't know. You just like oh. you know, with building that, or just like being flexing that creative muscle to to build that story, to yeah. to speak to people, to be relatable t- and. Yeah, watch the best at it, if nothing else. I've spent a life studying this stuff. This is what I went to school for, and this is what I grew up around because my father was like a top ad executive in New York in the 80s and 90s. It comes as a natural language for me. There's, uh, But if you know nothing about brand, there's never been more stuff accessible. And it comes down to a few principles. And people's faux pas in branding and, and, uh, and stuff like that... Uh, it comes down to not abiding when they stray from those principles. That's when bad stuff happens. Consistency. You know, uh, if you have a brand, your branding, it doesn't matter the medium. Your aesthetically, everything should tie in and be uniform. Mm. There, are just the, the way you speak to your audience via a newsletter, uh, tone, inflection, um, I've actually written a number of blog posts trying to help creators and makers think about these things because, frankly, there are a lot of awesome knife makers out there, and they're helped. just yeah. lost at sea okay. with developing a brand. And it's this, it's kind of like, so I, right now I work in the world, even though I'm a marketer, I work in the world of energy. That's mm-hmm. like, a, you want to see, you want to see horrible, like, uh, ideas about marketing or undeveloped marketing you go to engineering or or energy we're talking like i almost want to create a blog like they don't know what they're doing for free pro wow. bono uh and that that's that's been a thing forever uh, this is not a novel uh um but just just observe people who are bad at it observe people who are good at it there's a number of awesome podcasts i would recommend actually I live and buy, die by the podcast uh, yeah. for a number of reasons. Uh, YouTube, and look at some of the best cats out there from like, you know, uh, well, I won't name names because what's, what's they a have no problem promoting for, themselves. Yeah, what's a couple podcasts for branding? Is that what, well, what I mean, for starters, uh, marketing trends. I forget who okay. actually marketing hosts trends. that. That's like a great place to start. Those okay. are like top executives that you hear awesome. getting down on de- in detail. Um, also, You'd be amazed. Um, I'm, I've always, since I was very young, kind of what I knew to be true is manifesting now, which is kind of, pardon my French, but fuck everything you know about marketing. Mm. Like, a lot of it is nonsense. I've always been a big proponent of content marketing. The content has to be there. Everything else follows. There's a lot of garbage content out there. It doesn't mean that either. You don't just post things that are... So... If you're a knife maker or any craftsperson who wants to communicate their vision, mm-hmm. just talk about what you're passionate about and what's your wheelhouse. And your audience will follow because I promise there are other people out there that want to want solace to know there are other people out there like them. Mm-hmm. Everyone's gone through this crap. Everything I've gone through, like trying to set this up or all the mundane nonsense, like backed up on orders or you mismanage someone wants a refund because grounds you you. whatever makes you relatable yeah radical vulnerability again coming back to burning man or even if like a lot of tenets of anarchism if you want to go there we get we could existentialize forever and get very esoteric but uh radical honesty works in marketing too that's why content marketing is such a thing right now yeah people want to hear testimonial they want to know that you're an imperfect human this was your challenge this is how this product helped you work through it yeah and this is how you came out the other end and what do you have to say to people about it they don't trust media that uh like who pays attention to an advertisement anymore yeah or on legacy media like tv's unwatchable no one gets recommendations about services they should use uh via tv anymore they hear from they hear on social media on facebook from their family members and companies are that. still shelling out hundreds of thousands yeah, of dollars because not millions yeah because there's that 10 percent of people who are luddites and <laughs> or even worse they prey on people who don't know any better such as seniors a lot of the time uh you know how to get your how to end your tax 
problems, right, right. which pharmaceuticals are working the best for your condition. Uh, what else? Like uh, you may have been the victim of like uh, breathing in asbestos in your yeah. apartment 40 years ago. Get in touch with this lawyer. <laughs> yeah, right. And um, the good news is people today are very sophisticated. Yeah. And they Waking can see up. through that bullshit. Yeah. Um, We've covered a wide uh, breadth of subject but matter. but I, <laughs> I love it. Um, what's next for you, Gabby? Well, uh, I make a clear delineation between my many interests. Um, one thing that does have a great deal to do with knives, weirdly enough, is my passion for martial arts. So I train for day, sometimes five days out of the week, at least when school and work permit. I keep a pretty rigorous schedule. It's a lot of jujitsu, a lot. I've been training in Muay Thai at the moment, uh, or MMA as well. Uh, I have a full-time job. Uh, f- pretty rigorous family life and I get in here at the shop as little as I can these days it's just the way it shakes out for the time being Yeah. so I'm just plugging along I mean like I said I make what I like if it speaks to you talk to me about buying it but uh, it's not a very lucrative approach but it answers where I'm at in life right now and allows me to make things I actually really enjoy making and revisiting that has been very invigorating it's after like, a period yeah. of like kind of stressing out keeping up with found, a log you, you, of you, you overdue orders found the love so. back you know. yeah yeah it's kind of falling back in love with knife making yeah. i think it'll help reimagine the vision in the future i have uh if i was to make kind of like talk about my vision mm-hmm. um I, like i said i'm always thinking five steps ahead uh i've always been concerned with maybe augmenting the scope of knives to making more of an overture to the world of design at large. I've always been really in the housewares. That might have to do with kind of my Italian background. Uh, So there are two things. Probably starting some kind of a design prototyping firm and uh, spending time in developing as much intellectual property as actually working with materials. Uh, And then the second is... uh, is kind of getting it back in touch with my roots. Uh, Italian is my first language. If it were up to me, I'd spend the rest of my life there. Your and English so, is really good. Yeah. Well, I mean, I you know I grew up in New York. Just uh, my mother. Yeah. My mother insisted. So uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately, kind of migrating things that way and seeing if it's possible to uh, reapproach the knives in a way, at least spending a decent amount of my time overseas. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of a long-term vision. Cool. I dig it. Um, uh, where can people find you? Well, I'm John Gabriel X uh, on Instagram. And you can uh, check out my website at uh, JohnGabriel.com. Mm-hmm. You can actually reach me via contact form if you feel inclined. Um, you can also listen to you. Yes, I do have a <laughs> podcast, albeit, you know, much more casual and informal in nature than this one. This is, no, this I try is to very humbling, of course. <laughs> Dude, I'm very impressed by your level of uh, uh, production quality you invest it's in come this. come a long way. Uh, and you're, like I said, you're very prolific. Unfortunately, I'm not. Stop. Uh, I kind of just have a podcast where I get together with other makers yeah. I have around me. And... Um, that's called Construct Plus Imagination, available on the iTunes uh, podcast store. Where else can people hit me up? That's about the extent of it. Like I said, hit me up via the contact form on the website. Um, and that's it. I'm always happy to hear from everyone. Thanks, Gabby. Thank you, Vic. Um, thanks uh, for keeping it real. Yeah, man. Thanks for sharing a little glimpse into the world of knives and, yeah. and the passion behind it. Thank you for I, taking an interest. It's how this pod, it's I you're kind of step back from from turning it full scale kind of thing is kind of mm. like what because I don't make any money from this. This is for the love. I love connecting with passionate people because I myself still don't know what I want to do with my life. Right. Mm. So like, welcome to it, the club, man. Right. Like it just gives die. me. It, We're students till we die. <laughs> Even when you think you've figured it out. Uh, Isn't that, that's how life works. It's like the deeper down you go, the yeah. rabbit hole, it's like, I don't know anything. And that's fine. And that's where the imposter syndrome comes from. Yes. 
we could go into detail yeah. probably another time <laughs> yeah, okay, there's yeah. a subreddit i'm a really uh, a huge <laughs> fan of to that effect uh i think it's called like act like you belong okay yeah <laughs> check it i gotta out, check man. it out yeah it's all people faking it in their roles oh. uh in their everyday i'll check it out yeah uh speaking of imposters but um no thank you for having me uh we could probably talk all day and i'm yeah. happy to do it again um uh and yeah man i'll probably see you on campus for too, sure for that yeah I'm <laughs> monday monday nights in the fall um all right guys thanks for tuning in stay curious Aloha. i'll see you in the next episode Peace out. Mm.